Hi guys, welcome to module 11. Last week in module 10 we took a pretty low level look at some signal stuff. We looked at radio frequency signals and specifically how protocols like 802.11 wireless, Wi-Fi, use those signals to transmit data. We also looked briefly at some of the, the need to secure radio frequency signals and we looked at WEP. And WEP is wired equivalent privacy. And it was one of the first uh, means of securing wireless signals. We also took a look at how WEP was broken pretty quickly after its inception, although it uses uh, the RC4 cipher, which is a fairly secure and fairly efficient stream cipher. The reuse of the initialization vector after about 16.7 million packets or something like that, uh, the reuse of the initialization vector makes it so that adversaries can obtain the key. So we started to take a little bit of a look at securing wireless networks, but this week I thought it would be <clears throat> an interesting follow-up to take the discussion one step higher. We're actually going to look at mobile applications and how they're formed, the infrastructure that supports them, some of the frameworks, frameworks like iOS and Android, and we're going to look at some of the security implications that arise when we do mobile uh, application development as opposed to your more typical des desktop development approach. So hopefully you find this uh, useful um, and an interesting follow-up to last week. So why mobile apps? Uh, I think it's pretty clear now that smartphones are becoming pretty ubiquitous. We talked about how many internet connected devices there are nowadays. And if you think specifically about the cell phone market, smartphones make up more than half of all phones sold, um, which is increasing every year by the way. And of course, as you guys probably all know, smartphones come with a whole slew of applications. And these applications aim to take the typical desktop services that we're used to and provide a more convenient mobile interface that gives us access to these services on the go. And we can think of many use cases for these applications and with some of the functionality that our cell phones provide, like taking posting pictures, we can grab a car, we can buy sports tickets on something like Subhub, and there's just an infinitude of other applications out there that, that I won't go into, but certainly that exist. And so we're going to talk about how we develop these applications and um, more specifically some of the security risks and, and how we can mitigate them. And this kind of goes to show you with all of the applications that we have for mobile devices now, especially our smartphones, we talked last week in the online discussion about how the phones now contain so much personal data that the Supreme Court voted unanimously to extend the Fourth Amendment protections to our cell phones. Um, so I think as mobile computing becomes more prevalent, I think it just reinforces their decision. Um, so <clears throat> if you have any questions about that, take a look at last week's discussion and feel free to reach out to me directly. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that are different in mobile application development as opposed to typical server or desktop development. And one of the things is that there's a whole number of different platforms. And I know that in our mind, probably Android and iOS are the most popular. But, but there are a no number of uh, platforms that are still in use today. And I've listed some of them here. So Android and iOS definitely have the most market share. Uh, Symbian Windows Me, Windows Mobile Edition, um, and don't forget about BlackBerry. So the difficulty with having so many platforms is that, well, one, they all, they all do security differently, and two, the frameworks that they support for writing an application for their platform are different. So Android is primarily uh, supports applications written in Java, whereas iOS uses their own version of C, Objective-C. So one application does not scale across all platforms. Um, so that's one difficulty. Second difficulty is when you think about the user interface capability, different hardware may lack commonality as well. Um, so certain things are supported on newer generation phones that are not supported on older generation phones. Things like um, maybe multi-tap interfaces, for example. It used to be that you could just have a single point of touch. And now, nowadays, you can have up to five or ten points of contact with the capacitative interface 
and it's not backwards compatible. So the fact that um, different types of hardware have different uh, physical capabilities actually really impact um, the GUI design. And of course there are just some graphical capability that just differ from device to, uh, yeah differ from device to device. Um, nowadays we have you think of some of the screens that we have on cell phones as well as monitors we have 4k so 4,000 pixel resolution screens now um, and quite simply some of the things that we can do now we weren't able to do before so stuff tends to be limited by the hardware capacity um, and that's no different in, um, in from a GUI perspective we'll also talk about the types of resources that are available to apps um, phones now have multi-core um, removable media storage. They have lots more RAM than they used to, so we can run more applications or more intensive applications that we weren't able to do previously. But along with that, there are concerns when you run multiple applications on a device. If one application gets compromised, is it fair that all the other applications on that device are compromised as well? The answer, of course, is no. So what we try to do is establish some sort of resource boundaries for an application, which we'll talk about more in depth in the second half of this lecture. We use a method called sandboxing. But think of it like a hypervisor. Um, basically, we want to divvy up the resources on the smartphone, and we want to make sure that resources from one application never, ever come into contact with resources from another. And then, of course, we have uh, here, what's the definition of safe code? And I think the definition of that changes a little bit from a, a mobile perspective. Um, as you'll see later, some of the security mechanisms that we have, they take the onus off of the application developer because they don't have to be as careful with the security of their app because they can sort of leverage the, the mechanisms underneath. They can leverage the kernel. They can leverage the operating system. And then they can leverage some of the security framework that's put forth by the um, platform that they're developing on. Um, so the idea of safe code, will, you'll see, will, will change a little bit when we start to talk about it from a mobile perspective. So I want to touch briefly on the trip, traditional approach to, <clears throat> to securing applications. Applications were not as prevalent on the Internet as they are now. It used to be the case that um, networks were, were mostly private, and so the applications were hosted internally. <clears throat> so in order to restrict access to the applications, we didn't have to worry about application level security so much as we did to implement security at the network layer. So think of layer three, um, or the IP layer, and then we would segment the internal network even further at layer two, we could use VLANs, which are virtual LANs, um, they're basically broadcast domains, and we could separate traffic even further. So we didn't really worry much about the app layer, but we tried to segment things on the network level. And this did work fairly well when the networks were private. In other words, they weren't all directly connected to the Internet. And if I needed to give somebody remote access to one of these private networks, it was very easy to do, and, and still is, um, to just set up some sort of SSL or IPsec VPN into the private network so that people can go over a public network to have access to it. Nowadays, though, as we talked about last week, we're seeing a shift with these applications. So think about all of your smartphones, think about all the IoT devices that we've been talking about. All those guys sit directly on the Internet, so many more applications are using the public open internet as their main network and the idea of a private network is is beginning to shift and become beginning to become a little bit less popular so the issue we're faced with is we can't always just attack application security at the network layer anymore <clears throat> because the applications are much more wide open uh, than they used to be so we kind of need to look at things at a layer 7 perspective which is the app layer and we're going to talk a little bit about what that means next So I want to introduce you to something called a web service. Um, you, you may have heard the term a lot. There's 
terms like RESTful web services, and you may have seen terms like SOAP and JAX-RS, and a number of things for writing web services. But when it comes down to it, a web service basically responds to data requests. Um, think of them as individual functions, and they usually speak some sort of formatted uh, language like JSON or XML. And I can send a message to a web service, and I can get an answer back. So for example, a very, very simple example of a web service, I might send a JSON list of numbers and the web service might give me the average of those numbers back. So it's basically just a modular function that has an HTTP a web interface to it. So I can call this function over the web, I can post some data to it, and I can receive some answer in return. So Good non-mobile software design used to mean that you take the interfaces to your code and you keep them private. So that was always a main uh, feature of software design. And also if you were to catch an exception in your code, which is extremely important so that your code just doesn't crash and error out, you didn't want to send too many, uh, too detailed, uh, too detailed a level of error to the user because malicious people could actually inject bugs into your code and see how it failed and they can begin to deconstruct your code if the, the error messages were too detailed. And also you couldn't, didn't really have this idea of trust. <clears throat> we could not trust users in the sense that since we were securing things at a, a network level, we kind of just understood that the people who were accessing the application were already trusted because they met the criteria of the network layer security. Okay, so we didn't really trust the users, we just kind of understood that since the network layer and so the level 3 security was in place, that we could more or less understand the people using our applications were the people that we, that we knew and we expected to be using it. But web services really take these assumptions and just flip them on their head. Um, so everything is extremely public. Um, debugging becomes much more important because you have to work with many, many different people who are using your endpoints, and then if they're experiencing errors, they need to be able to tell you something about them. Um, so opening up the, error, the, the, the level of error logging is important. Um, and you have to have some level of trust, but as you know, trusting, trusting people on the public internet is, is really an unsafe assumption to make. We don't always know who's going to be accessing our web services, and so, again, having user trust is, is a difficult thing. But so there's definitely something we can do about this. Um, although IP security isn't sufficient, it says here we must be content aware. In other words, we're gonna pay special attention at the application layer to a lot of the information theoretic concepts that we mentioned in the beginning of the class, which we'll start to see on the next slide. But things like confidentiality, integrity, non-repudiation, and auditing, um, all of those things are gonna become very big when we start to deal with these, these very public web services. So of course, since we're completely publicizing our application, the, um, the attack surface for these apps grows. Um, so it's not just a, an interface that can be exploited. Remember that there's, they're still residing on the network. The applications are still running on some OS. They have some sort of data store that's tied in, in the background. So there's still a very, very large attack vector. And the fact that we're opening these applications up publicly just kind of makes things worse in a sense. So think back to, to week one, and we talked about this, the CIA trial, which was confidentiality, integrity, and authorization. And so these are some of the ideals that we want to try to maintain when we talk about providing security for, for publicly available services like these HTTP web services, for example. So when we use a web service, um, there's a lot of different things we want to do to be able to gain that, that application layer security, to be, uh, to be content aware, so to speak. And you can see here, I, I listed some of them, I won't read them all, but to be able to inspect traffic to authenticate users and then based on that authentication to authorize the users, um, to encrypt data, to hash data, to make sure integrity has remained and data hasn't been altered. So these are some of the things that we're, we're going to want to pay special attention to in order to um, provide a more enhanced security model for our web services.
And probably not too surprisingly, the threats to web services are very similar to threats to web servers themselves. In fact, they're very much identical, with uh, maybe with some nuances that we'll get to later. Uh, you're familiar with DOS by the, at, at this point. You're familiar with um, unauthorized access and modifying data and, and manning the middle attacks. So the same suite of security threats that exist for web servers actually exist for web services. And on top of that, in the second half of this lecture, we're going to talk about some more security nuances that, that arise. So at the app level, we want to be able to control who accesses the web services. Of course, it becomes difficult because we're making this thing very, very, very public. But just because it's public doesn't mean that anybody can use it. Maybe they're aware of its existence and maybe they want to try to send a request to it. But it turns out that we, we can enable authentication on these web services. So they're not just completely public to the sense that anyone anywhere is able to use them. Um, that would be a completely insecure implementation, so we're not going to do that. And some of the ways we can very simply secure a web service are using a traditional username and password, which is okay, but it's not a great level of security. So another approach could be digital certificates. And that provides some better guarantees uh, than a username and password, certainly. So we'll look at a demo this week on a tool called PubCookie, and PubCookie does um, integration, sort of federated authentication for web services um, across organizations. Um, so that's a tool that we're going to look at. It's, it's used a lot in authenticating web service requests. Uh, so we're going to look at a demo um, and towards the middle of the week uh, on PubCookie. Of course, we know that after authentication occurs, we're concerned with authorization. We need to make sure that once we know someone is who they say they are, we need to know some more about that person, and we need to know what level of access should they have. So there's a, a couple, there, there are more types of access control in this, but I listed two of the, the major ones. And one of them is DAC, which is direct access control. And this is the idea that someone manually specifies a level of access for one of these security principles. So if uh, your user authenticates correctly, then some admin somewhere has predetermined your level of access and, and statically mapped you to the assets that you're able to view. And contrast that a little bit with a role-based, which we call RBAC, which is role-based access control. Role-based is, you can think of it as there might be a CEO, there might be a, um, a technical lead, maybe an engineer, and an HR representative, and then maybe a custodian, all of whom might have different roles within the organization and different access to IT based on those roles. So the roles in that sense are, are uh, excuse me, the access control is basically based off of your role in that case. So it's probably clear that a low-level engineer is not going to have the same role as a CEO, for example. And an IT engineer and an, someone in HR are also not going to have the same role. So these roles are predefined so that when you just drop someone into, into one of these groups or into one of these roles, um, then their access is predetermined for them. And as messages are being exchanged back and forth, if we're authenticated and authorized to use this web service, we're still concerned that sending the data possibly in plain text um, leaves it open and other people can, of course, read it. Um, but we're also concerned about integrity because people can possibly um, alter the messages that are trans transmitting back and forth between the client and the web service. Um, so just like we've seen in, in the beginning part of the class, we're going to use digital signatures to ensure integrity. Um, and we're going to do encryption anytime the data is at rest, and preferably we're going to use SSL for when data is in transit, um, as we've talked about. 